From the heart of the jungle comes a savage cry of victory. This is ML, Lord of the Jungle. From the black core of dark Africa, land of enchantment, mystery, and violence, comes one of the most colorful figures of all time. Transcribed from the immortal pen of Sean Windsor, ML, the bronzed white son of the jungle. And now in the very words of Mark Fellhauer, the story of ML and the decoy. Get your finger out of my face. Get your finger out of my face. Take the first shot, then if you want to get your finger out of my face. It's gone. What are you doing? What are you doing? That is not paid for by them. That is paid for by the people of Detroit. Let me tell you something. You want to go right now? Okay? You want to go right now, Albert? I'm I'm tingling a little bit. I'm, I'm I've got a little bit of the shakes because this has been what Ice Cube would have called. A very good day if he was an investigative reporter. Oh. Because we were out and about trying to find a guy who said he would talk to us, and then he wouldn't talk to us, and then he lied to us about where he was going to be this week. But guess what? We figured out where he was going to be, and next week where he's going to be is on Fox 2, telling us some stuff that I will leave you to judge the veracity of, but it's your old pal ML Elric here, and I'm pleased to be joined by Mr. Mark Fellhauer, who I, I think is anyone. feeling some longings. He's feeling some Sean Windsor withdrawal because uh, little Shawnee, our Lord Windsor, is not with us again. Our Lady today. Windsor. He will be joining us later on by uh, telephone, and uh, I think right now he's working on something for the Detroit Free Press, possibly something about the Detroit Lions. Um, I can tell you. What he's going to write has to do with how they should get a chance. They people should, you know, uh, with reserve judgment. They're trying their hardest. Doesn't sound like Sean. But what he should write is season over for the Lions. It's over. Hey, let me ask you this: Move on. Is there an over under number? I don't know if you're a gambling man or not. Is there an over? I do like to place a wager. (laughs) Is there an over under number on wins that would make you want to jump on the over? For the Lions. Yeah, a realistic number. Yeah, I pay so little attention to the Lions that I have no idea what would be reasonable. But it's Just the NFL. Based on history, I would say if I could put some money on the Lions to win uh, over five or six games, I would probably place that wager. What if it was six and a half? If it was six and a half. <laughs> that was the line I saw. Like, I don't think huh. that I would. Okay. I might place your money on it. You're a smarter man than else's. I am then. But I did make a wager recently on Michigan State at, at maybe eight or eight and a half games. So I'm very confident. Hmm. Very confident. Also, also put some money on them getting 14 points in Ann Arbor for the annual Michigan-Michigan State game. Well, you, you put that bet down already? Yeah, in Vegas. Really? I had a friend in Vegas. He, he laid the wager for me. 14 points? Isn't that ridiculous? It's just they have to score over 14? No, no. Uh, no, no. Uh, we have... Oh, they're getting 14. Getting 14 points. That is a little ridiculous. It is ridiculous because even <laughs> when Michigan State stinks, they keep the game fairly close unless they try and do something stupid like a two-point conversion when no one cares. I don't know how you bet on a line when you haven't even seen the teams play. Well, how do you rank a team nope. anywhere when you haven't seen them play? I, I mean, know. When it's, they lose so many players and all that other stuff. So It's uh, very, very silly. So, yeah. So, no, Lions. Uh, Sean is a, is a kind and generous man <laughs> who uh, he doesn't say the glass is half full. He says, he says hey, free glass. <laughs> so he's. Um, he says the glass is halfway. Yeah. Or maybe he's just trying to keep up his enthusiasm to have to watch that dog pile all year. But um, but we we look forward to him joining us a little bit later for our great debate. And I hope we have a pretty lively debate because this is a subject where it's possible we could all agree, which um, I don't think we will. But stay tuned to see where we go with that. But anyways, I, I want to talk about a couple of stories that we've we've done. We've had uh, some some big uh, stories that we've completed and some that we're working on. A story that aired last week that you can find in the link uh, on our website, ML Soul of Detroit. You'll see a link to the story you did for Fox 2. 
on the 24-year-old young man who was accused of killing the other 24-year-old man in that brutal beating at a gas station in Detroit. You probably know it as the one where the black guy beat the white guy to death. I, I hope people aren't seeing it in those terms. That's one of the things we were very concerned about when we started scrutinizing the, uh, the alleged perpetrator in this case. You know what's interesting? I hadn't even, I'm not lying, I hadn't even thought of that angle until you just said it. Oh, now. really? Has that been out there? I mean, you're, oh you're working the story, so you probably... Well, let, let me tell you what my life is like. I can find a public official who is dead nuts guilty, may even confess, may have even been caught in the act. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people will send me emails and post on social media and leave me voicemails saying, you're only doing that because they're not white and you're white. So almost every story I approach, I have to evaluate in terms of what are people going to throw at us and what can we do to make it abundantly clear. I mean, like so clear that even a blind person, I was going to say Stevie Wonder, but I want somebody to say it's racial. <laughs> oh, plus Let me say see. that who's a blind white guy. Are there famous blind white guys? Oh, wow. I Other mean, than yeah, Homer. Be. I mean, it's been a couple of centuries since he did uh, the Odyssey, but yeah, so there's that even a, a oh, blind I you meant Simpson, but we have to think about what someone who can't see it, that even Helen Keller <laughs> or Andrea Bocelli or, um, or, uh, some blind Aldous Huxley. Aldous Huxley was not blind. Would you get this web stuff out? That, that intramanet can't be trusted. That that uh, Jeff, who's a guitar player? Oh, that Jose Feliciano. Jose no. Feliciano. Okay, that's going to be blind. Anti Hispanic. So I got to be careful. Anyway, at any rate, we have to be very careful to Jeff Healy. Jeff Healy. That even Jeff Healy uh, wouldn't uh, object to. I've lost my train of thought. That was such a terrible tangent. But anyway. So when we do a story like that, we have to think about that. And we have to, and I think it's appropriate to say, you know, am I seeing this from all angles? Am I considering all the ramifications of this? Am I thinking about how the public is going to perceive this? And so I was hesitant to do this story. I've been spending some time at Juvenile Hall going through some files. And I've been thinking, should I pull this file? And at some point we had heard that the, uh, the uh, suspect, once he was arrested, had a difficult life. And I thought, okay, well, now it's finally time for me to dive into this file. And what we found is that since this kid was nine years old, he has had a very, very rough life. Now, is it his fault? Is it, is it his environment's fault? Is it his parents' fault? You know, I'm not here to judge that or say. I think it would be reckless for me to even weigh in on that. Uh, does it really matter? Well, so here's the other thing you have to consider. We don't dive into the background of every person who's ever been arrested for a heinous crime. So why this one? Well, in this case, it was so high profile. It was so shocking. It, it, it really captured people's attention because of the video of the beating, which was, was just Brutal. grotesque. Mm -hmm. I, I think people are out to demonize the suspect. So I thought it was important for us to say, well, is there anything mitigating in this person's background? Is there something? Because when you are in juvenile hall, it's not just delinquents that go there. It's children who have been in difficult home situations, who have been abused, who have been uh, neglected, who have been abandoned, who are born addicted to drugs. And so we went to go look and see what was in the file. Now, here's the flip side. People will come after you. And I think somebody did make a comment along these lines. I want to make sure I don't mischaracterized the account, but immediately after the story aired, somebody's like, oh, there you go, as if I'm trying to excuse the crime by saying that the person who did it had a difficult record. So this, well, it's you, kind of a no matter what you do, somebody's going to take a yeah. punch at you. Well, you're trying to understand, I would assume, like why something would happen. Sure, and we're trying to find out, frankly, could this have been prevented? And, and we're still doing some digging on this, well, for those, those that didn't see the story, and this, of course, is the, the uh, murder of Tyler Wingate. Yes. Now, now, the whole black-white right. angle that you brought up, I, I saw it more as a city-suburb angle because... Same thing. Cause I, well, I, and it's funny, I didn't think of it that way. I don't know why. Well, I, I, don't but, mean, I don't mean the no, city's right. black and the suburb's white, but I mean but you get is. the same thing that says... Divisiveness. You only care because a kid from the suburbs was killed. Well, now, yeah. the kid who was killed was a Detroiter. He moved to he Detroit, did. so yes. we're going to claim him. Those of us who are in Detroit are going to claim him as a Detroiter. But yeah, he lived uh, in the Boston Edison Boston district. Edison, yeah. Yeah, and Berkeley, you know, where I'm from, that, and maybe that's why I thought about it, because there's white uh, ribbons all up throughout the whole city. 
Unfortunate choice of ribbon, by the way, folks. Maybe a different oh. color would have been nice. <laughs> I didn't even think well, it's about a, that. Aspect. A story with yeah. some racial overtones. Could we? Could we come up with a, a, a sky blue ribbon? I don't know. Well, what, what are the Berkeley High high school colors? Blue and red. Okay, Berkeley give me Bears. a blue yeah, ribbon. Blue and red one, maybe. Good enough. Um, so Lawrence Davis, the accused, mur- the alleged murder. What did you dig up, and what did you find for those that didn't see your story last week? Well, both of you who didn't see my story, <laughs> ignorant <laughs> bastards. Um, what we found is that since this kid was nine years old, he was in trouble, uh, starting with a curfew violation, and it escalated all the way till he was 18, where each of his encounters with the law seemed to be more and more violent. And at the same time, uh, his support system was breaking down. It looks like his dad was never in the picture. At some point early on when he was getting in trouble with the law, his mother died. Uh, he was with his grandmother for a while. Then either she couldn't handle him or, or she was sick, and so he went with another relative. Then he ended up with another relative. Then he ended up with uh, sort of a friend of the family. Then uh, by the time he was 18, um, you know, he was pretty much, he'd, he'd run out of ways that the system could deal with him, mainly because it, it seems to be, it seems to me, from what I saw and from some of the documents I reviewed, that he had some mental health issues, yeah. and he was not receiving tremendous treatment. Uh, since Engler closed, Governor John Engler closed most of the state's mental health facilities, it doesn't seem that there's a good place for somebody like that to be housed. So you either have to put a kid like that in prison, where he's not going to get help, or you have to put him in various alternative uh, treatment programs where... Hopefully he'll get help. And then what ends up happening is by the time they're 18, and this was one of the most chilling things I thought we ran across, is by the time he was 18, the, uh, the judge in the case in juvenile court had ruled that um, there's nothing more we can do at this level, and we feel that he is no longer a threat to the community or to himself, which clearly was not true because almost as soon as he became a legal adult and was no longer under the jurisdiction of juvenile court, he was in more trouble with the law, um, some, some fairly minor things. But at one point, he was charged with domestic violence for uh, allegedly assaulting his aunt. And the case was dismissed because she didn't show up in court. But that, that case happened just a couple of years before he's accused of killing this young man in the street. So you can see this continuum where there's a crescendo. And I think one of the questions that I have is, could this have been prevented if there was another way to put him in a more intensive situation where he could get more care? And the family refused to speak to us, although they did call screaming after the story aired. That's what I wanted to ask you about, because there's a shot where you're talking to some people uh, who are on their porch, and you mentioned that they didn't want to talk to you. Did they share anything with you? That, that you can share, uh, sure. even though they didn't want to go on camera? Sure. So I'll, I'll share kind of what they said after, um, but uh, we tried to get them to speak, and what we said to them was, listen, it, it sounds like a lot of people are very critical of, uh, of this young man, and we're looking for someone who can tell us about him. Whatever you want to say, good, bad, otherwise. You know, uh, they wouldn't talk. They were very upset, and we said, well, we're just looking for somebody to say something for this person. And I said, it seems like everybody's against him. And they said, well, God is for him. And I said, well, you know, I don't want to sound flip here, but I can't get God on camera. So I need someone on earth to say something <laughs> in his I defense. I don't to laugh, but that's a, that's and, a, pretty, well, that's a really mean, good comeback yeah, line, actually. So, you know, and, and if God spoke to me, and I, I hope he's guiding me, but if he speaks to me, you know, uh, tell me what to do. Because every day I'm just like, I hope this is the right thing. Oh, man. But God's so, like, don't drag me into this. So we aired the story. And then, of course, I got an angry phone call from the woman we'd spoken to saying, you know, why don't you do this? Why don't you say that? You know, um, you know, he's 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 not right. He's mentally ill. And I said, well, those Why are the things you that we say need that. Yeah. you to say. That's what we need you to tell us. And then there was some screaming, and then I just said, well, you know. And then the phone went dead. So, so they did They're speak, but out. not in a in a uh, appropriate or uh, helpful way. But that's what happens. Again, we give people a chance to have their say. 
If they choose not to, well, then we all live with the consequences. But and meanwhile, our, Tyler is still dead. Tyler is still dead. His family's still grieving. I think the people who care about the young man who's accused of killing him are also grieving. And the guy who's accused of killing him, based on what I've seen, you know, I, if this guy spends the rest of his life in prison, um, you're going to have a very sick individual who is not getting better. And uh, I don't... S- you know, it feels like there's going to be another chapter to this story, and it's also going to be very bleak. Yeah. But uh, but we'll well, we'll there, keep an eye out. The actual incident, there was some misinformation at first. Was he the only? Uh, was Lawrence the only person in that car? Or was he a passenger? Uh, according to what I've read, he was a passenger in the car, and the car he was in was at fault in uh, striking uh, Tyler Wingate's car. Um, so is the driver in trouble? Uh, not that I know of. He certainly or she hasn't been charged with anything or identified as far as I know. So, so of huh. course, it's not illegal to be involved in the fender bender. No, but I mean, if the passenger of the car is beating someone to death, I don't know what kind of responsibility. I don't know. Yeah, I, I don't think we have a good Samaritan law in Michigan. I don't think it's, you know, like Seinfeld, where yeah. if you don't intervene, yeah. you get you get locked up and, and you put a lousy end to a, a finale, one of the yeah. greatest uh, <laughs> shows ever. Yeah. But... Um, but this, this notion of, you know, we got to be fair to people and we have to give them an opportunity to uh, speak for themselves kind of leads us into where we were today. But uh, b- before I get into that story, I got to speak for somebody who's above the fray. That would be Mr. David Hall, who is a good Samaritan. At least uh, they did right by me when I refinanced my house. Hall Financial is a sponsor of the Red Shovel Network, as you well know. And we can't emphasize enough how important it is to have David Hall and his company supporting us because they've taken a chance that we're touching people, that we're <laughs> introducing people to quality content. And, uh, and based on my experience, I think Hall Financial is a pretty decent outfit. If you want to refinance your home, they'd love to save you money. You can email David at dhall at hallfg.com or you can call Hall Financial at 248-308-5000. You know, interest rates are going down. The feds have lowered interest rates. That may mean that some of the best deals you're going to get for quite a while are now available at Hall Financial. Give David Hall a chance and get lower rates, better options, and more personal attention. They move fast. The industry average for refis is 44 days. They say they can average 19 days, which means in some cases they may even do it in less time. Now, Dan Morrison is the guy who helped me out along with Shannon. I don't want to put them on the spot. Maybe they can't do it in 18 days. I don't. Maybe Dan. I think Dan can. Let's let's test Dan. Yeah, Give him a call. Put him on the spot. Maybe yeah. do it. In Come on, Morrison. Where you been? <laughs> D Hall at HallFG.com or call two four eight three zero eight five thousand. Give them a call. Thank them for giving the Soul of Detroit a chance to stick around for a while. Let them know that ML sent you. NMLS one four six seven four three five. I don't know what to do with all the money they're giving us. It's crazy. It is crazy. Are stakeouts fun? Uh, it kind of depends. Because every movie I've seen with a stakeout looks like a blast. Like in The Naked Gun where they're eating all those pistachios. Yeah, but then didn't one of the guys in the stakeout, like, murder somebody? Email oh, uh, maybe. I don't know. Was that... Was that, uh, that might be a different movie. OJ? Wasn't he in The Naked oh, Gun? Oh, <laughs> that's right. Was No, it wasn't him with him, was it? I don't know. I don't know, but I... And then there's, of course, uh, sometimes you get the banana in the tailpipe when there's yes, the stakeout. That was, that was the, uh, the old Mumford trick. Yes, so, Mumford uh, High. So what we did was, in this case, you know, I think people, if they've seen our stuff, they know that uh, we don't just go get people. We just don't confront people. I like to do what I call encounters, which is where we give somebody an opportunity to sit down and meet with us and explain what seems to be inexplicable. And often we find out there isn't a good explanation, but we feel like we need to give people a chance to do that. So and we that, contacted. That happens first before the stakeout. Yeah, the only yeah. time we'll come get you without warning or without an opportunity to meet with us is if we think we're going to catch you red-handed. Like if you're not going to work, we're okay. not going to call and say, "Hey, we think you don't go to work. Uh, can we sit down and talk about that?" And they'll be like, "Well, I'm at work right now." Mm-hmm. And then they go to work early for the next couple of days, but then then people kind of fall in their own habits. Yeah, then they but, become people again. Yes, but we want it, We want to. We want to give them a chance. So we contacted a a, a politician. Uh, last two weeks ago, and said we are looking at some 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 campaign finance matters that we think uh, people deserve to have explained to them, and we'd like to meet with you. And this person said, "Oh, I don't I don't really think there's anything wrong there." We're like, "Well, you know, let's 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 get together. Maybe yeah. there isn't. You can explain it to us. Help us see, like uh, like Stevie one." And can you tell us like what uh, what kind of politician 
Uh, this what would level be a of politician? state lawmaker, a suburban state lawmaker. Okay. So for all those people saying I'm only picking on Detroiters, come on, watch all the stories, damn it. <laughs> but so you gave him the opportunity yeah. to meet, and he just. So he said, uh, you know what? I'm really busy this week. Call me at the end of the week, and we'll set up a time to meet next week. So we did. We called Friday evening. Then I got, oh, you know what? I don't really know why we need to talk about this. We sort of explained that. So they're just told me at this point that, ah, oh, he's going to forget. Well, then he said, I'm going to be on the road for the next two or three weeks, so it's really no good time for you to meet. And I said, well, wait a minute. We did you the courtesy of giving you this whole week. Yeah. And then uh, well, now you're too busy. I said, that kind of feels... Like, uh, you're pulling a fast. He's like, oh, no, you know, I just, you know, I'm busy. I got to be out of town and this and that. And he said, well, you can't spare an hour for us? No, I'm really, I'm really busy. And then, then it gets into, you know, and by the way, you know, you called my home. I'm, I'm not real happy that you called my home. In 20 years, I've never called anybody at home. And I said, well, first of all, people call me at home all the time. That's why I have a home phone. And I said, and the other thing is the reason why we called you at home that's the phone number you listed on all your campaign finance reports. <laughs> that's what you listed as your campaign number. It's in the public domain. I only called it because that's the number you put out there for people to call. And he was, okay, fair enough, fair enough. And I said, <laughs> so why don't you want to meet with us? I thought you had kind of a reputation as a straight shooter. And he says, well, you know, you got kind of a reputation too. And we didn't get into that too much, but he's seen me go get his colleagues in Lansing, so he knows – what our reputation is, but maybe he doesn't because our reputation is if you don't meet with us, we meet with you. Mm. And when we call, we're offering you the opportunity to figure out where and when we're going to meet. We're not giving you the option of whether we're going to meet. So one of the things I love about you is that you, uh, you can see bullshit pretty quick. Maybe, but also I don't see Windsor here. When, (laughs) when someone starts to push you, or uh, be maybe a little bit of a bully, like why are you calling me? I don't mean because that would scare a lot of people off. Like, oh yeah, maybe I'm bothering this person. Well, it's easy to be tough on the phone. I think that just energizes you more. Uh, I, I think it pisses you off. The, the Kilpatrick people realized very early on that I'm the wrong guy to try and intimidate. Yeah. And at, at one time, uh, Kilpatrick himself kind of looked at me and said, "You play hockey, man. They shouldn't be trying that on you." <laughs> now I'm a terrible hockey player, but I am really good at not being intimidated. <laughs> So <laughs> there's Kilpatrick again. I know. He's everywhere. Being he's, very likable though. He's, he's, no, he's but like, I mean uh, that's a very likable comment. No way. Yeah. You know. Well, he's he was very likable. He's that's throwing his whole staff it. under the bus. By he was saying, very yeah. likable. Yeah. Just don't. Uh, yeah. Don't try and do business with the city or bring your women around him. <laughs> so uh, or leave a credit card where he could get his hands on it or petty cash or. Well, anyways, I digress. But so we decided this week we're going to try and find this cat and so we you know we do a little homework and it turns out where this person lives is in the canals in a very long and winding road which is really tough for us because we can't sort of sit on the street and watch it because everybody in that neighborhood knows who belongs there and knows who doesn't belong there explain the canals so if you go out into macomb county or venice italy they have canals or maybe parts of Florida, and, uh, and there's just a, a, a narrow street. There's homes on either side of the, the street, but the backyards front onto water. Actually, in, in Detroit, on the east side, we have canals. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, really, everybody there is looking out their front window at you because you can't be you can't a block drive over. Through. You can't yeah. yeah. So, initially, we thought, oh, my God, this is going to be like the worst place to do a surveillance because we're so high profile. We really stick out here. So first day, we kind of do a little recon, think, oh, my God, this is really bad. Then we come out and we say, well, let's, let's look around. So my partner usually goes out there first. Uh, I'll come out just to, to see what, what do we got going. We look around and we realize, yeah, uh, my partner isn't just, you know, whining. He's like, this is, mm-hmm. this is bad. I'm like, you know what? It's worse than you told me it was. So I'm, I'm all in on this one. So we start looking around. And uh, we realize, hey, through the backyard, you can kind of see a park on the other side of the wall. So now we try and figure out, how do we get to that park? Do you ever think at one time, like, getting a boat? Uh, Yes, we've done that before. When I was at the Free Press, we did a story on Art Van's mansion, and we had one of our uh, assistant metro editors who had a boat go out there to get some pictures. But you kind of can't hover in a boat. You know, when you're sitting yeah. in a boat on a narrow canal staring at somebody, it's like... People are going to start wondering. Yeah, what's yeah. up there, Pally? So we figured out how to get in the park. And on Tuesday, uh, my partner set up in the park and... The great just, sleuth. Just watched. 
and got some video of our man who was supposed to be out of town. Oh, now he's a liar. Walking around the neighborhood, huh. comfortable as can be, matching short and, uh, and, and T-shirt. Very attractive, very fetching okay. uh, combo. A nice little... Well, at least he's going to look good on TV. Probably Garanimals, where he could match the hippo to the hippo, so he got the <laughs> right top and the right bottom. Yep. And, uh, and we also figured out that as difficult as it is to get into this neighborhood, it also means there's only one way out. And so we set up where we're at the couple blocks, well, actually a couple miles down, because you have to go several miles to get out of this area before you can turn one way that gets you out of, you know, this corner of the world. Hmm. So we couldn't catch up with this, this, this gent yesterday, but we came back today and uh, had uh, our secret weapon watching from the park. And then my partner and I were able to uh, meet up with our subject at the Chill Box, which is a, a great name for a place to meet up with, with someone for a, a heated exchange. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, How surprised? This individual was uh, surprised, not happy to see us. And, um, and the rest, I guess, we'll, we'll show you. Uh, and you soon. said it's campaign finance? That he's uh, campaign finance accused funds. of misspending. I I, I don't want to characterize okay. it. I'll let the experts speak to it. But but you tell me what you think. This is someone who's no longer running for re-election. They've reached the end of their term limits, uh, and they're not running for any other office. They have a sizable amount in their re-election fund. What are you What are you supposed to do with the re-election fund? Well, th- the law says there are several legal ways to dispose of that money. One way is to donate it to charity, which this person has done. Another way is to donate it to other political candidates or entities like the state party or mm-hmm. whatever, which this individual has done. Another way is to refund it to donors. Um, this person has taken some donors out to dinner, but I don't know if that's exactly the kind of refund the state envisioned. And then, then the law is kind of vague. It doesn't provide a whole list of prohibitions, so that leaves it open to some interpretation. But what this person did in the last six months or so that they were in office was they spent thousands of dollars on office furniture, and An they bought themselves leaving. a laptop. Well, 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 it's not his state office. It's his home office? that's supplied. Well, I don't know. That's what we tried to find out. Did you buy furniture for yourself, or did you buy it for something else and you, that's is it the, the kind questions. of furniture that um if you were buying it you would spend that money on or if you had somebody else's money you would buy more like so, placing a bet on the lions over yeah so it doesn't say it just says office furniture okay. from art van so okay. actually i'm sorry it just says furniture from art van so oh. it could be i don't know a, a nice divan maybe perhaps a davenport <laughs> Davenport. but um my grandparents used to <laughs> call, my grandma they had a leather the, couch they called the davenport, davenport yeah which i thought uh Wow, what a... I never understood. Is that a name brand? Was, was that a name brand? I don't know. It, it seems like a great name for uh, a, a fancy apartment complex, um, a really cool band, or a high-priced call girl. I'm Lindsay <laughs> Davenport. It's like, oh, Lindsay, please come right in. I want to sit on a Davenport. I want to yeah. lay down on a couch like the sloth that I am. What is that perfume? Is that... Uh... It's a Davenport. Yeah, so... Uh, what, uh, what else did he spend the money on? So all furniture... Uh, furniture, laptop. Um, laptop. Huh? Amazingly, uh, on his way out of office, he spent a thousand dollars on stamps. Th- wow! So He's I got a lot of stuff to mail, huh? Well, yeah. Um, so we have some more questions that we're still trying to get answered. But Would we stamps do- be a good way to launder money. I mean, would he resell them? Well, the thing about, I mean, they're forever stamps, right? So you can always use them. Yeah, but nobody mails anything anymore. Um, if you run a business, you might need to mail things. Oh, okay. And that goes with the furniture. But I don't know. Yeah. A laptop. So this Allegedly. Is, this is a business person. So we've asked them for explanations. And one of the things we heard was, I don't got to answer your questions. So he said, hmm. well, maybe you don't got to, but don't you think the people who trusted you, you to represent you them for so long are entitled to some answers? Um, and to keep knuckleheads like us from speculating as to what it would be, just take the mystery out of it. Not a good look for him. Not a good look. So we should have that story coming up for you very soon on Fox 2. And, of course, we'll, we'll fill in some of the blanks in an upcoming episode of ML's Soul of Detroit. I won't change my mind on anything, regardless of the facts that are set out before me. I'm dug in, and I'll never change. Great nut. Great so. Great nut. Great so. Great nut infinity. Great so infinity plus one. No. 
So I have a little carryover. I, I never really did answer uh, Mark's question about are stakeouts fun. They're very fun when you catch up with the person you're trying to get, but you can spend days in hot cars, cold cars, nervous that if you blinked you missed them, worried that they're not home, uh, concerned that you're in the in a wrong neighborhood, dealing with people knocking on the window all the time saying, what are you here for? What are you doing? Still, you're not supposed to be here. Still sounds better than the office. <laughs> Anything is better than the office. And I actually have a, a decent kind of a funky office, but I, I, I always say that there's no news in a newsroom. You have to go get the news and bring it back. So, yes, I, we, would, we would much rather be on the street. And uh, my partner is like an Iron Man. No matter what the conditions are like, I'm always saying, well, maybe we should go. I mean, I know you've been working a long day. You've been here since the crack of dawn. Is it time to go? Is it, I can go a little longer. That's good. So uh, I, I don't you. I don't know what his kidneys are going to be like when he retires, <laughs> but I'll tell you right now, I, I, if he had a Secret Service call sign, it would either be uh, the Iron Man or uh, or the Full Iron Bladder. bladder. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> speaking of of strange uh, ways to contain urine, Sean Windsor joins us on cell phone from uh, from the People's Republic of Ann Arbor. Is that right? That sounds good. Whatever you say. I That's like my motto. It's the Democratic People's oh, the Democratic Republic People's of Manor. Okay, great. Well, I don't know if we want to be so agreeable to start our great debate, but let's see where we go with this. Uh, I, I truly have no idea where we're going to land on this, but I want to in, alert these gentlemen and perhaps the world that Uruguay has issued a warning to its citizens about traveling to the U.S. after mass shootings that killed more than 30 people. The, uh, the Latin American country also cited three cities specifically that its citizens should avoid. Albuquerque, Baltimore, which you may have heard is a rat infested, uh, whatever, and Detroit. Hmm. Now, we have a lot of individual shootings. And any mass. We shootings. have a, a lot of violence and crime. And I hate to say that, but it is true. But how are we? We have not had a mass shooting. I don't know how we get uh, looped in on this. And so I read this and I say to myself, hey, Uruguay. What's your deal? And I was getting ready to make a smart aleck comment about, well, I wouldn't be so cocky if I were Uruguay. Well, it turns out, at least according to the good people at Wikipedia, that <laughs> Uruguay is a super safe and very groovy place to live. So I'm going to let Uruguay off the hook. But Venezuela oh, well, is suggesting dump. that people postpone travel. Don't forget about the Japanese, too. So not, what, what? The Japanese don't like us? Uh, well, they just said, you know, that uh, people traveling here, Japanese citizens, should be aware of potential gunfire uh, because we are a gun society, which we are. I mean, oh, damn. So, so what do you guys think? Is Uruguay, uh, is Uruguay getting uh, carried away here, or are they? is there some merit to what they say? Well, okay, well, a couple things. First of all, Uruguay also, or Uruguay, sorry. Uruguay's also fine. Also warned its citizens, or at least uh, advised its citizens, to stay away from theme parks, religious gatherings, malls, basically sort of a, a list of where these shootings happen. It, it, to me, and look, we do the same thing in the United States. Our State Department issues warnings, uh, advisory travel warnings that get certain countries from time to time. You know, you can go on uh, their website and find out where you should travel, at least according to the State Department. So in that sense, that's all they're doing. But I think I think what's uh, problematic. But they singled out Detroit. I mean, I it's one thing to say they, be careful they, they in did, America, but they, well, that was off a list, right? They're looking at the most dangerous cities ranked by number of homicides per hundred thousand, and Detroit still ranks, even though the numbers have gone down. Obviously, the population. Well, we, we've we've killed enough people that we're running out of people to kill. But the, but the, but they're just going by stats, right? They're looking at numbers, and there and Detroit's numbers, along with Baltimore and maybe even St. Louis and some other cities, unfortunately rank with some of the most um, problematic areas in South America. Mexico, I don't know that it's quite with some of the areas in El Salvador, for example. But so they're looking at the math, so that's part of it. Except but I though, think if the thing that precipitated them issuing this warning is because of the mass shootings in El Paso and Dayton, that hasn't happened here. Yeah, what are you no. running for president, Uruguay or Uruguay? No, but, it, no, but I understand what they're trying to do. They're, look, they're as, as they're putting this list together of, Okay, stay away from these kind of gatherings, these kind of shopping centers, or whatever. Oh, by the way, just stay out of these cities altogether. Again, they're just they're just looking at the list, and I know it's maybe hard for us because it's not our perspective, but I do think it's the it, here's the problem: it's it's the unpredictability, and I would say that's true in Detroit and and Baltimore and some of the cities. 
I mean, maybe you, you might say, well, this neighborhood, that neighborhood depends on the residents you speak to, and you can look at zip codes and look at numbers. But to, to, it's really this idea of you don't know where it's going to come. But how they from. leave Chicago out of that? You don't know where it's going to come from. I mean, isn't Chicago but, like the deadliest place on earth now? How do you is, leave Chicago more, out of that? It's because it's far more contained in Chicago because that city. So we're separated. We're segregated city to suburb. Chicago is segregated within the city. North That's and true. south, basically, right? Yeah, there's a few so, neighborhoods on the south side that are somewhat integrated or mostly white, and that's where and, there's a lot of tension. No, I know, and it's getting in, in, you've been to Chicago, I assume, recently. The further south you go, you used to go downtown, from downtown to the University of Chicago, which is like a couple of miles or whatever, a few miles. That was kind of no man's land to some degree in terms of what you're talking about, but that's, a lot of that area's been judged by, too. Not that we want to get off on a discussion about Chicago, but I think that's the idea, maybe, that at least downtown and certain neighborhoods in Chicago, they you know tourists feel relatively safe. It's all a matter of perception. I just wonder, do you think Uruguay slash Uruguay um, has issued warnings, say maybe against Nice, France, or Berlin, Germany, where they've had truck attacks in busy areas or attacks on soft targets, or is this, or maybe it is an anti-American statement? I don't know if it's an anti-American statement as much as, and you're right, you, you list places, but do those places otherwise have day-to-day? It's like Toronto's had a couple of attacks, or at least one that I can think of. Um, but day-to-day, are those cities generally safer? They don't have the gun violence that we have. And we just, we, we, anymore, we have no idea when or where it's coming from. When was the last tourist that got murdered or even shot in Detroit? Tourists don't come to Detroit unless they're Germans coming to the Electronic Festival or whatever, but they're or maybe uh, some French, maybe a couple of folks from Amsterdam sprinkled in. But or a ball game a, or the Super Bowl. Tour. You yeah, hate right, the continent. <laughs> you right, are biased against Europeans. <laughs> no, I I love Europeans. You know, they, they, but I, just not the so Germans they, and the French. And don't put no, them in the same room. No, no, no. That, the, start the World hipsters, War Three. The young hipsters come over. That's cool, and they want the experience. They want the, uh, the the sort of chic experience of getting next to heroin, but not actually using it. You know, that kind of thing. <laughs> wow. I, I, I just, I, the thing about Sean is he seems so nice and so, but when you listen to him closely, he's very dark. <laughs> he's a very dark, hateful person. Until he realizes he's being dark. In all, in all seriousness, though, don't you think I was that serious about that. the unpredictability of what's happened and what's, what's happening is what is starting to unsettle so here's where, outside this country? Here's where I find myself in an un, uncomfortable place. I agree with Sean. I think that if you are in a country where you don't know where the next eruption is going to happen in another country, you got to tell people to look out. Now, I'm a little, a little hacked off that they singled out Detroit, but uh, sorry, boy, Dayton I, and El Paso couldn't be more different. They couldn't well, be more it's, different it's than random. Garlic City, it's California. It's random. Let me ask you guys this. It's, it's very random. Are you any more fearful today of going anywhere in this country than you were before these, uh, well, actually the three shootings, if you want to include Gilroy? I am fearful of uh, going any place where someone who is off their nut might have uh, fixated on. Well, I work at a, I work at a TV station. I know, but you don't know where five that's reporters be. were killed at a newspaper last year. There yeah. was a gunman report. There was a sighting of a gunman today. At USA Today, USA today. Virginia, at the headquarters. The false false report. Yeah, thankfully, no journalist would be harmed if there was a shooting at USA Today. My but, point. Um, my point being is, it's so random. It is. I'm not going to change my lifestyle one no, you, bit you, because you, of it. And if I play, wanted to travel to Uruguay or Uruguay, I would do it. Or if I wanted to travel, yeah, it anywhere. sounds like Sean could show you around since he loves it so damn much. <laughs> but um, but um, I, I I do think that uh, more and more. There's a feeling of what's going on around here. A friend of mine is a reporter in Dayton, and uh, I talk to her regularly, but the best thing I've seen her post online in forever was so-and-so checks in that she's safe. Mm -hmm. And last time we visited her in Dayton, she showed us the Oregon District. It's a really, really cool place. It's also very small, and it's the kind of place where someone could do a lot of damage in a short amount of time, as as we now know, so I I I do think there is a real concern about where could this happen, and uh, I guess the one thing I would say, which I'll give Mark, God, I, I'm taking both yes. sides. Am I Sean Windsor now? Yes. But the one thing I would say <laughs> that I'm going to give Mark is, it could happen anywhere. So leave Detroit out of it, and that's your great debate. Oh man, the geeks have inherited the earth. Can I do that? What a dork. 
him wanting to play with us again mean that he's turning into a geek or we're turning into cool guys? After big news happens, you will almost never see me post anything about it uh, online, social media, anywhere. Uh, Partly because I'm a reporter, so you shouldn't know how I feel about things other than sports and music. It's just not appropriate for me to have an opinion. But I also think that in the 24 hours after any crisis, most of what you're going to hear is crap. There's all these explanations from people who haven't got the whole story, uh, trying to make judgments without gathering all the facts. Finger pointing immediately. There are visceral reactions. And God help us if somebody tries to come up with a solution to a problem that just happened. Because the solution you come up with is not well thought out and typically... Generally, you cause a new problem. We see that with our legislature all the time, where they're out there trying to fix legislation or fix a problem without holding hearings, without speaking to experts, without consulting with people who know what they're talking about, without hearing from the public. So which brings me to a lawmaker in Ohio, a a woman named Candace Keller, who shortly after the shootings, not far from her district in in Dayton, Ohio, and very far from El Paso, but certainly she has no idea what's going on there, posted on social media, after every mass shooting, the liberals start the blame game. Why not place the blame where it belongs? The breakdown of the traditional American family, thank you transgender, homosexual marriage, and drag queen advocates, fatherlessness, a subject no one discusses or believes is relevant, the ignoring of violent video games, the relaxing of laws against criminals, open borders, the acceptance of recreational marijuana, failed school policies, hello parents who defend misbehaving students, disrespect to law enforcement, thank you Obama, hatred of our veterans, thank you professional athletes who hate our flag and national anthem, the Dem Congress, many members whom are openly anti-Semitic, the culture, which totally ignores the importance of God and the church until they elect a president. State office holders, who have no interest whatsoever in learning about our Constitution and the Second Amendment. And snowflakes, who can't accept a duly elected president. Did I forget anybody? The list is long, and the fury will continue. Wow. Well, I would suggest that this is exactly the kind of diagnoses that doesn't help anything and only exacerbates the problem and makes it harder for us to actually get through the fog and get to the heart of the matter and start to figure out why these things are really happening. And it has nothing to do with the fact that she appears to be extremely conservative. It has to do with the fact that here is somebody just spouting off crazy incendiary stuff less than 12 hours after uh, that, that, that perfectly fits, the last person's died. Perfectly fits her platform. It's interesting the only person or blame that she didn't place was on the actual shooter himself. Oh, well. Which I think is kind of interesting. So I guess she did forget somebody. But I would say the same thing if she said, who do I blame? I blame the gun nuts. I blame the people yeah. who want to, uh, you know, take abortion away. I blame the people. I mean, this kind of rhetoric, this kind of dividing, divisive talk is not what we need at a time like this. And there's something to be said for the pause for poise. And Candace Keller, you should have paused because you got no poise. In the past, we've had uh, loyal listeners to Room 7609 mention Love and Rockets, and we've talked a little bit about them. Well, guess what? This week, they're front and center on Room 7609, because when you talk about Love and Rockets, you really talk about so many other amazing bands, like Bauhaus, where three of the members of Love and Rockets came. The seminal, the definitive goth band, which gave rise to... Tones on Tail, which was an outstanding sort of a gimmicky, uh, gothy, poppy band. And then Love and Rockets with a tremendous song that I like to call No New Tale to Tell. You cannot go against nature Because when you do Go against nature 
nature is part of nature too. Our little lives get complicated. It's a simple thing. Simple as a flower, and that's a complicated thing. like to hear their name i am no exception please call my name i love that i like that song i just love i love i love the winds you know when you uh and i don't mean like the winds like at taco tuesday but uh the fact that the daniel ash the guitar player can not only shred it he also plays a mean saxophone and flute and you've got that that rich sonic music bed there with those guitars underneath. I don't really classify that as new wave though. Really? Yeah. Oh, now if you heard you know so it sounds like early alternative to so, me. So yes, it's it's very trans transitory because they're taking you from goth to pop. And so I think it's new wavy because um because this is a new wave segment and I really wanted to play. <laughs> no, I'm glad you no did. New ta- I was going to play Kundalini Express, but it was a little too, eh, you know, a little too slow. Off. I, I, want, I was going to play um, It's All in My Mind, but I thought with these shootings, I didn't want people to yeah. think it was some sort of, you know, voices uh, see, in my head that were trying to send some sort of message out there that were trying to communicate to you through your dog. But so, uh, back to Love and Rockets, you, you have Bauhaus, Goes to Tones on Tail, another great band, Goes to Love and Rockets, and then the sort of the 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 family tree is out of Bauhaus. You get Peter Murphy, who was not in Love and Rockets, but then you have Daniel Ash, who's played with a bunch of people. Again, some of that cross pollinization you've talked about with new wave bands. David J, who's the bass player, has played with a bunch of people, and Kevin Haskins, who is David J's brother. Yeah, I know his last name should be J, right? Well, it turns out. <laughs> David J's real last name isn't J, and Haskins' real last name isn't Haskins, but his daughters are in a band, Black Black. So, huh. uh, so you have this great lineage. And and just a three-piece, too. It's... Just a three-piece. And look at, listen to all that sound. Sound, yeah. 
you know, now, of course, you know, multi-track, you got the acoustic and the electric. Sure. I'm sure it's all, and he lays down the flute track, too. So three guys can make a lot of noise when they have, um, when they have some, some different uh, production elements there. But for those of you who have said, you know, you like Love and Rockets and you like So Alive, well, everybody knows So Alive. It was a big hit for them. We thought we'd get a little deeper into the uh, Love and Rockets catalog. This was something of a hit, so it's not totally obscure, but... Man, if you're going to play Love and Rockets, you got to play some of the best stuff. Love it. Um, we want to get your mail. Uh, if you have not written to us, we love hearing from you at uh, mlssoulofdetroit at gmail.com. We heard from Gus, who says, Loving the podcast. Hope to cross paths at DCFC soon. If you were at the Cleveland playoff game, that was me and my crew that were heckling the goalie from Sweet <laughs> Four that day. We plan to be back at their September game. You are welcome to join. I like the sound of that. Huge James Bond fan. You shafted, shafted Living Daylights. I think the most authentic James Bond movie made. Interesting. That was a Timothy Dalton movie, I believe, wasn't it? Uh, Here's some suggestions. 88 lines about 44 girls by nails. Great 1984 controversial new wave jam. Craig is an RSN junkie and recently tuned into the soul of Detroit. Love the show. All the RSN shows keep me company while traveling in southeastern Michigan, northern Ohio, and Indiana for work. Listen to the most recent episode and the request for Room 7609 tunes. I have a couple for you. One, Electronic, British supergroup with New Order's Bernard Sumner and Johnny Marr from the Smiths. Biggest hits is were he most just likely... In every band, Johnny Marr? He is. Getting away with it or get the message, but I really like the instrumental Soviet. Those guys were great. Overlooked. Now, we have talked about Electronic before just going through the lineage of different bands. And, of course, P, uh, Johnny Marr played with Brian Ferry, who was in town last weekend. I was at that show. Fun show, but Brian Ferry is starting to show his age. Also, a suggestion for Spandau Ballet. I know, I know. How soft can this guy be? But outside of True, <laughs> they had some decent songs. Check out Highly Strong, Communication, or the Decent Guitar on Only When You Leave. Well, of course, one of the first entries we had, one of the first guests in Room 7609, was uh, Spandau Ballet Mm -hmm. with a great tune that you can find on our Spotify playlist or go check out our catalog of back issues, back episodes at mlsolvedetroit.com or wherever quality podcasts are found. Uh, Craig ends with a P.S. Oh, hi, Mark. Oh, hi. Again, we're getting more feedback on Room 7609. My favorite section of the show, minus you telling Sean and Mark where to stick their U.M. opinions. Uh, This comes from... MSU Chala. So, uh, so I guess we shouldn't be surprised. Oh, hi, Mark. <laughs> at the, uh, at the uh, clear headedness of our writer. I love all the songs so far, and I feel like I shouldn't offer suggestions, but mm. Ride Vapor Trail is a must. You get that new wave feel for the first half of the song that everyone should experience. I will check that. I'm not familiar with that one. Then you're left on your own in the second half, a few chords to start, then the drum beats, then the strings. To me, a classic forever. Keep it up, bud. Love the podcast. There's a shout out to Bud, the uh, the uh, uh, the dog who could catch footballs. So Air Bud, yeah, Air Bud, yes, exactly. Uh, Doug writes, just a thought, but a little dinosaur junior freak oh. scene would fit in great. Oh, wow, yeah. Anyway, keep up the great work. Great show, listener Doug C. Now we believe in representing all views and hearing all voices. And believe me, I listen to this show after we record it, and then I listen to it again mainly because I need the downloads. <laughs> but we have not figured this out. I, Mark knows what he's doing. I don't. So we want your criticism. We want your feedback. We want you to tell us how to do it better. And we're not just going to read the butt-kissy ones. And, uh, and that's good because Jeff writes, Uh-oh. I'm not all caught up, but I heard you play The Beautiful South. I hope you have, in an episode I missed, played or mentioned the House Martins from where The Beautiful South came from. Uh, Jeff, you will be very happy that we dive into that. Um, and here's where things turn from affection to to uh, uh, constructive criticism, I would say. You guys can be slappy Democrats. It's not a crime, but as a classical liberal libertarian, it's getting old. You guys thinking what's being passed off as capitalism is actually free market capitalism. It's crony capitalism, which knows no party affiliation. So when you and Windsor make thinly veiled mentions that Republicans are bad and Democrats are your savior, you can say, trust the mainstream media. You can't! Mm. You must be autodidactic. 
Ooh, nice words, Spaz. Uh, um, uh, Jeff, I appreciate the feedback. If the mainstream media could be trusted, you guys wouldn't be intentionally misleading people by lies of omission, not using proper definitions, etc. It's these things that got and will again get Trump or worse elected, that and there being no Democrat Party anymore. They are authoritarian leftists now. Whew. So Jeff wow. has got quite a bit to say, a lot to, uh, a lot to chew on, but we appreciate. I'm just glad you didn't include me in those. Yeah, I don't know how I come off as as some big lefty. I'm trying to (laughs) to uh, walk right down the middle. I I tend to be um, uh, fiscally conservative and more libertarian in my social views, which means like most people, I'm comfortable to let people do, or I shouldn't say comfortable. I'm willing to let people do a lot of crap that I don't approve of because I do think we have the right in this country to do a lot of crap, and that's why. Mm -hmm why uh, it's such a great country and why it's the best one. No matter what Uruguay Uruguay Ever. Says. Well, actually, after reading about Uruguay, I got to say, okay, it, it, we may have to go to a runoff between uh, <laughs> us and Uruguay. But, uh, but so uh, now I, gee, I sound even more like Sean Windsor. Anyways, we appreciate you listening. Please support our sponsors. You may have noticed this week we have only one sponsor, Hall Financial. Please call them, buy a house and finance it just to support the show. Oh, wait a minute. That seems kind of expensive. There's another way you can support the show and help fill our sponsorship gap. You can donate. Mark, tell them how. MLSolarDetroit.com, and then right at the top, uh, it says donate. Seems pretty straightforward to me. It's so easy. Maybe you should just try it to see if it's really as easy as we say it is. There's another way you can support us, which is buying our merchandise. We now have stickers. We now have super groovy T-shirts. And we have signed autographed copies, I guess that means the same thing, of the Kwame Sutra. Each one includes a, a fairly unique, smart aleck saying, uh, written and conceived of by me personally. Mark, where can they find all that great stuff? DrewandMikeStore.com. Really easy and to you spend. You can sign all those while you're on your next stakeout. You know what? I, I actually I did sign some books really? uh, this so you week. You get a lot that, done when you're on a stake. Yeah, we've we've donated those books to the Michigan Campaign Finance Network to help them raise money to keep their great work looking into campaign finance reports and and curious cases. We did work with the Michigan Campaign Finance Report on this story, so more about that on Fox Two News soon. Uh, thank you for listening. Please, we want your feedback. Listen to all the Red Shovel Network shows. That's No Filter Sports with Eli, Denny, and Bob. The No BS News Hour with Charlie LaDuff. And, of course, the preeminent, the Mac Daddy, if you will, the Drew and Mike podcast. We'll also hear Mark sometimes trying to keep things straight. And you have been listening to ML Soul of Detroit here on the Red Shovel Network. Cyrus, get us the hell out of here. Can you dig that? Can you dig it? Can you? The jungle is a place of violence. Gora will gather his guards and a safari will be formed to take you home. I have no home now. My father's gone. Um, El. Let me stay here in the jungle with you. You shall go back. But you called me your white goddess. You said I was beautiful. Your beauty is only of the outside. Inside you're as cruel and as ugly as the civilization that spawned you. And to that will you return!